Good morning and good day, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Christy Taylor, and uh, every, on behalf of everyone here at Interop, we want to thank our wonderful speakers for joining us today, as well as all of you that have made the time to listen and learn. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, we'll have the chat, so please feel free to post your questions there, and then we'll address them at the end of each talk. And just a friendly reminder to keep out all your microphones on mute so that we don't have any uh, background noise. And then um, each speaker will go in this order. First, we're gonna hear from Dr. Christina Ferroni. She's the chair of Department of Surgery at Cedar sinai in uh, California. Then we have Dr. Mirazami, professor of Department of Surgical Oncology in Southampton in the UK. And then Dr. Dukajin, Blacka from the Ohio State University Department of Radiation Oncology. All right, so thank you. Dr. Ferroni, if you are ready, we can get started. Thank you, Christy, and thanks everyone for having me here. Um, what I was going to do is really just share some of the actually MGH data um, that we have from um, all the you know, IORT work that we've done in the past. And it's going to focus on pancreatic cancer. Um, and let me just share my screen here and get this. Don't worry, not all those. Oh, it's bad if you start at the, at the end, right? Um, sorry. I apologize. I don't know why I did that because we were starting here. Apologies. So, Please stop me if you have any questions. It's meant to be interactive and I'm gonna keep it fairly short to about 15, 20 minutes. And hopefully I can answer any of the questions that you have. So back in MGH, um, when I was there, I was there for about 25 years and my mentor, uh, Andy Warshaw, started intraoperative radiation therapy for pancreatic cancer with Chris Willett, the radiation oncologist back in the late 1970s. And so there's a long um, history of treating pancreatic adenocarcinoma at MGH. And so when you think about pancreatic cancer, and I don't know how many of the people on this uh, session really spend most of their time taking care of pancreatic cancer, but it's really, if you think about what we want to offer patients and for any cancer is really a potential cure, help them live longer and make them feel better. But for pancreatic cancer, it's always this push and pull of metastatic and local disease management. And unlike the other solid cancers, the metastatic disease has always been so aggressive that local disease management has played a smaller role than in other diseases. And so this is really what's changed over the past, I would say, decade or so, 10 to 12 years. And the local disease management has become much, much more aggressive. And this continuum that you see here is what has pushed the local management, including surgical resection and radiation, much higher onto that picture than it was before. Before when the cancer touched any of the vessels, there was really no local disease management. Everyone said, oh, it's never gonna come out. You're gonna leave a positive margin. And a lot of places didn't have any other local treatment modalities. But as systemic therapy has significantly improved, this local disease management has become a much bigger part. And so we take all of these tools that we have in our toolbox to help us treat these patients. I just thought really fast we'd go through the definitions just so that there's where everybody's on the same page. So for resectable, you need to have less than 180 degrees of venous involvement and no arterial involvement. And of course, in all of these definitions, no metastatic disease. Borderline, you can have more than 180 degrees of venous involvement, but less than 180 degrees of arterial involvement. And then locally advanced, is having more than 180 degrees of arterial involvement. And both borderline and locally advanced has been the areas where the management has changed because the systemic treatment has improved so much. Now for locally advanced, because it's such a broad definition, 
the surgeons have agreed that there actually needs to be parsed out a little bit more. And Susan Tsai did a really great job putting some of these definitions together to really talk about what, what people think is is feasible to surgically resect because uh, arterial involvement is not the same across the board. A lot of it also depends on which artery is involved and to what degree and can you reconstruct it. But in the end, what really matters, and these are old series, these are series before systemic therapy improved, is do you have positive lymph nodes and do you have an positive or negative resection margin. And I think for most solid tumors, we can all agree that a positive margin is a poor prognostic factor because you're leaving tumor behind. And this is where this vascular involvement has always been the Achilles heel of pancreatic operations. And it's not only the retrospective series, but also the prospective series that, again, confirm that an R1 resection is worse for patients. But what changed in 2010 or 2011 when it was published in the New England Journal is that systemic therapy dramatically improved. And we went from just two agents, 5-FU and gemcitabine, to a three drug regimen that doubled the survival in metastatic disease. Now for most solid tumors, they, they chuckle a little bit when we say, oh, we went from six months to about 11 and a half months of median survival for metastatic disease because you know, in, in the grand scheme, they say, well, it's only six months improvement, but it is a doubling of the survival. And in a tumor that has such a poor prognosis, that is significant. But it really changed the way that we looked at patients and we looked at what we were able to do for them. And so that was the change in systemic management. And at MGH, we had the advantage of having this long history of intraoperative radiation therapy. And the reason that I show this for the background is, is that between 1978 and 2010, 194 patients were treated. And you might say, okay, so what does that have to do with what we're doing now? Well, it was really important because all of these patients were essentially treated with 5-FU, some of them with gemcitabine, but it, most of them with just 5-FU, which we know that as a single drug is not very effective. These were patients that were taken to the operating room and the surgeon could not get the tumor out because there was vascular involvement. And the patient got between 12 and 15 gray of intraoperative radiation, right? So you have a subset of patients that have a significant benefit in their overall survival from only radiation. There is no real systemic chemotherapy given to these patients, right? Because we know that 5-FU doesn't do very much. And I think that that teaches us many things. One, it is an important tool for a subset of patients. And we, of course, have a lot of work to do to figure out what subset that, that is. But as systemic therapy is improving, this just adds on to what we can offer patients. This also allowed us to be more aggressive uh, about 10, 12 years ago. And so this was one of the first patients who we treated. And this was my patient who was a young woman, had young kids, and she presented with this three and a half centimeter pancreatic cancer that was involving the SMA. You can see right here. So tumor around more than 180 degrees of the SMA and a CA199 of 985, which really is consistent with micrometastatic disease. She received four months of fulfirinox, and this was right, you know, this was just as the New England Journal paper was getting published because it had already been presented at ASCO, and she was young and healthy, so the medical oncologist Dave Ryan was sure he could get her through fulfirinox, and she had a pretty incredible response, and then Ted Hong said, well, let's give her radiation and let's see what happens, so we gave her a 50.4 gray of radiation. And then you look at the scan and you can see that there's still haziness around the superior mesenteric artery, but our CA199 went down to 37. And we had a really long discussion with the patient and many heated debates in conference about how best 
to manage her. She was young, she was healthy, and she said, you know, I want to swing for the fences and see if you can get this out. And we felt ethically that this would be okay because we said, okay, she's had a tremendous response. And if I can't get it out, I can give her intraoperative radiation therapy and give her up to 15 gray boost. And it can potentially help her live longer, even if I can't get the tumor out. We thankfully were able to get the tumor out. She had a 1.6 centimeter T2N0 um, tumor with negative margins. But this really began this change in management of pancreatic cancer. And we published our first 35 cases back in 2015. And it really has had a significant impact on how we treat these patients. What's come up more and more is about how do we manage arterial disease? Do we do an adventitial stripping or skeletonization or um, dive, what we now call divestment, where we really take the adventitia off of the uh, artery so that we can remove the tumor? Or do we push for an arterial resection? And, and Mark Trudy, who's at the Mayo Clinic, has really been a strong advocate of arterial resection and reconstruction. But the reason I put up his data here of his 123 cases is that there is significant morbidity and mortality when you're looking at arterial resection and reconstruction. Um, whereas I will show you the MGH data where we lean on divestment and doing intraoperative radiation therapy to be able to get these patients through this. I think other groups have also realized this, even people like Marcus Buchler, who many of you know, who is a very aggressive surgeon, that divestment really is something that needs to be considered and be in the toolbox. But we were able to push for divestment because we had IORT. So I'll just very quickly run through the retrospective data of about 500 patients that we treated that were either considered borderline or locally advanced. Almost, they all got fulfirinox with, a, um, with the, the majority of them getting it for approximately eight cycles or four months. And you can see that the patients got about, about 40% of the resected patients ended up getting intraoperative radiation therapy, and those who couldn't be resected but didn't have metastatic disease, they almost essentially all got IORT. And the 4% that didn't get IORT was because uh, we had a time frame where the machine was broken, and so we didn't have that in our armamentarium to treat the patients. And here you can see that uh, over 90% got more than six cycles of, of systemic therapy, and that obviously is very, very important in this disease. The majority got pre-op, so neoadjuvant radiation therapy, with the majority getting 50.4 gray, uh, and then a smaller subset that had a very dramatic response to, to systemic therapy got a short course SBRT. I, I have to say we've seen better uh, results, especially when there's arterial involvement using 50.4 gray um, in terms of being able to get the tumors out. So we were very worried, you know, when we were doing these operations because we knew that they were operations that took us more time. We knew we had more blood loss. Uh, we needed to do more vascular resections. And you always wonder, are you hurting patients? Is this a technical exercise or is this really something that the patients will benefit from? So we compared it to the patients who were upfront resectable. We said, these are our best actors. These are patients who, are, who don't need neoadjuvant therapy to be able to get their tumor removed. And so we were happy to see that we did not have an increase in the grade three complications or readmissions or length of stay. And most importantly, we didn't have an increase in death. So here you can see those patients that got neoadjuvant therapy had a 90 day mortality of 1.6%. And if you remember back to Mark Trudy's series from the Mayo Clinic, you're talking about a 90 day mortality of 7%. So that's significantly higher. What was nice to see is that those patients who got upfront neoadjuvant therapy had a much lower pancreatic fistula rate because the duct tends to be larger and the pancreas tends to be harder. The path results correlated with what we saw in terms of 
of uh, what we would expect for neoadjuvant therapy, where we had less node positive disease, we had an R0 resection rate of 80%. And remember, these are patients who present with venous and arterial involvement. We had less lymphatic invasion, less perineural invasion. And you can see that even 6% of the patients had a complete pathologic response, which of course in pancreatic cancer is almost unheard of. But the patient, what do they care of? They, they care about the fact that are they going to live longer, right? We're putting them through six months of therapy. That's pretty grueling and, and it is hard to take. And we're happy to see that the median overall survival was 41 months for those 370 patients compared to the um, historical and, and, and average median survival of 23 months for those patients who were resected and did not get neoadjuvant therapy. Now, a lot of these patients also got just gemcitabine or 5-FU and didn't get full ferinox. So what about IORT in the, in the era of this neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So when we went back and looked at the patients who we resected, who we gave intraoperative radiation therapy to, we saw that those who had an R0 resection and those that had an R1 resection, that their, their overall survival curves actually had some overlap and were not statistically different. And we felt that, that in the setting of an R1 resection, an extra boost of radiation intraoperatively may contribute to better local control and potentially better overall survival. And a lot of this data, if we've got been criticized by because they say, oh, well, it's only one institution. And so, you know, we're very thankful to Intraop because they, they um, sponsored the PACER trial and we really are, are wrapping it up and are excited to publish the data. Um, but this was really an important step because that way we could roll it out to many other institutions and we could do it in a systematic way where we have very well controlled data. So I guess what I would conclude with is that, you know, pancreatic cancer, like every other cancer, is not just a KRAS mutant tumor, but rather is, is very different. And it has a very different, it's not a single cancer, as we like to say, and there are genomic differences. What's also interesting, which is a paper that we published in Cell, is that while we know that there's heterogeneity amongst patients, there's also heterogeneity amongst the tumor glands. And once we start treating tumors, we can actually affect their phenotype, right? So fulfirinox will push tumors from an epithelial to a more quasi-mesenchymal tumor type. And so understanding this biology and understanding where radiation fits in and who will benefit most from radiation is incredibly important. And this is where um, the research that's funded um, through different mechanisms, including intraop, is just so important because we, what we want to do in the end is treat our patients better and treat the patients who need radiation with radiation. So in summary, just a better understanding of the diverse biology is going to allow us to better select patients for systemic and local therapies. But what I think is really, really important for pancreatic cancer is that this improvement in systemic therapy really allows us to really push the forefront of local treatment to try to improve the patient outcomes. And as this arterial divestment resection experience increases, we'll be able to better define who will benefit from which approach. But I do think that with divestment, we have the opportunity to use IORT and we have the opportunity to uh, to treat patients in a way that they will not have significant morbidity. And we know that the IORT has not increased the morbidity of the operation. It does add about 30 minutes to the operation, but it has not increased the morbidity of the operation. And so like most surgical oncology uh, talks in the United States, we all like to quote Blake Cady for his biology is king statement that he uh, presented at the Sir John presidential address. But it really is true. It's the biology and then trying to manipulate the biology that will get us to where we need to go. So thank you all very much. And 
I'm delighted to take any questions. And what I can do is leave the slides up in case anyone has any questions about any of the slides. I didn't notice any questions coming up in the live chat. So anyone? Happy to answer anything about logistics. I didn't put a lot of things in terms of how do you set up the machine and things like that. Um, it, it, is, it becomes very fast uh, once the team is, is used to it. And what we would usually do is give around 12 gray to those patients who are resected and patients who are not resected about 15 gray. Well, Christy, if there are no questions, I can gladly pass the baton and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Froney, that was excellent. Dr. Merzami? Yeah, shall I go ahead? Please do, thank you. So, um, good morning, uh, everybody. Hope my screen is now being shared with you all. Um, can you all hear me? It's my, great. Yes, okay. we can hear you and we can see your slides. Fantastic. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all today. I'm delighted uh, to be talking to you and slightly surprised that I'm going in the middle. Usually as a colorectal surgeon, we're always down at the bottom somewhere, but um, hey, so it is. Um, so I'm gonna talk about IORT for rectal cancer, if that's okay. Please feel free to ask questions at any time and I'll answer those, but hopefully you're not gonna come across anything dramatically new. The principles are all very, very similar to what Christina has very elegantly described. So uh, just a quick disclosure. Um, I'm going to talk about, this is the overview of what I'm going to talk to you about, which is locally advanced rectal cancer and locally recurrent rectal cancer, which are the key indications for intraoperative radiotherapy. I'm going to talk about the evidence and the lack of it. I'm going to talk about our intraoperative radiotherapy journey, uh, the rationale, the evidence synthesis we went through, the funding, implementing, and our experience to date. I'm going to talk about the ELECTRA trial, which we're running, and the challenges in trial development and design and why potentially actually we would really value your help and input with the trial and patients uh, going forward, potentially, if this was some, an area of interest to you. And then I'll summarize. So I'll, I'll skip through this bit because hopefully it's, 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 it's very straightforward. But colorectal cancer is the third commonest cancer and the second commonest cause of cancer death and a very major cause of healthcare expenditure. And the rectum is always the commonest site affected. IORT, as I explained, is generally indicated in rectal cancer in the two situations, locally advanced rectal cancer, which usually accounts for 10 to 15% of all cases, and locally recurrent rectal cancer, which is 12% of cases. I'm not formally defining them, but definitions are critical here. Some people would define locally advanced rectal cancer as a T2 tumor with lymph nodes. This isn't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the really ugly tumors, and hopefully the pictures will demonstrate that. But these are complex conditions associated with really poor survival, and historically they've been managed really badly. Survival is typically measured in months, and it's not a nice few months. These are relentless pelvic pain that's refractory to analgesia, discharge, awful tenesmus, fistulation, sepsis, and social isolation sets in for patients. And certainly when I was training as a surgeon, this was often described as one of the worst ways to die. Um, Multimodality treatment incorporating radical surgery is the best option for cure and also provides the best disease control. But one of the most important indicators is achieving an R0 or clear resection margin. Um, and is the key focus of the management of these two particular things because it predicts for survival and quality of life. As Christina alluded to, it should not be a surprise to us that leaving cancer cells behind is a bad thing and it is important in colorectal cancer in gynae cancer, pancreatic cancer, retroperitoneal sarcomas, bladder and renal cancers, recurrent anal cancer. It, it, it's common sense. To enable an R0 resection, however, within the confines of the pelvis, frequently necessitates for locally advanced and locally recurrent tumors, a pelvic exenteration operation, which is a radical and extreme surgical solution involving on-block removal of the pelvic organs, which are contiguously involved by cancer based on radiology. But nevertheless, even with ultra-radical operations in centers with significant experience, positive margins can still occur in 30 to 50% of patients having these pelvic exenteration operations. 
Why? Well, because achieving an R0 is, is difficult in the pelvis. Why? Because radiology is imperfect. We know there can be poor resolution in some settings. The distinction between abutment versus direct invasion is difficult. And there can particularly be confusion when there's been sepsis or neoadjuvant therapies. We know that assessment at surgery is very imperfect, particularly, again, if there's been sepsis or post-neoadjuvant treatments where tissues change their turgidity. And because getting higher and wider resections in the pelvis is not always easy anatomically, surgically, or in terms of the loss of functions patients may incur, and also not all close margins can be easily or should be modified with further surgical extensions, perhaps. And so if margin control is likely to be an issue, predicted close or involved, this is when IORT is likely to have a role for locally advanced and locally recurrent rectal cancer. Particularly in certain anatomical zones in the pelvis um, are associated with a higher rate of positive resections, and that's the pelvic sidewall and the posterior compartments. And the addition of IOT is one option in these situations, hoping to convert an R1 resection to an R0 outcome. It offers a therapeutic edge in challenging tumors. It works synergistically with surgery, and you give the highest dose of radiotherapy to the area of most likely tumor cell persistence while displacing and protecting radiation sensitive structures. I'm going to talk about so some examples of tumors that are not for intraoperative radiotherapy. So this is a, a locally advanced uh, rectal cancer. I'm sorry, ap apologies for the quality of this MRI. It was from a unit referring to us, but it's a very centrally placed tumor. I know I can get an R0 on this with very reasonable margins because it's very central. This is, this is not the kind of case that we would use IORT for. And this is a locally recurrent rectal cancer in a male following a previous anterior resection and this tumor encroaching onto the uh, prostate and the back of the bladder. Um, and again, this is a very centrally placed tumor. This does not read IORT, IORT in our hands. So what are the sort of tumors that we're talking about? I'm gonna go through these briefly. Um, here we have a very ugly tumor uh, making, uh, almost encasing the whole of the common iliac artery and making contact with the common iliac vein and over um, L5 vertebral body. There's a tumor, it's added on a PET scan. That is one that's had IOT. Another tumor here into the side wall of the pelvis. Pet habit again next to it. Uh, another ugly locally recurrent tumor making broad contact with the non expendable pelvic vessels, the external iliac vessels there, artery and the vein. Broad contact here with the anterior table of the sacrum from a local recurrence. Uh, another patient with a local recurrence in a male patient following a previous abdominal perineal excision, making contact with the base of the penis and the inferior pubic ramus. Uh, a very large locally advanced tumor filling a lot of the pelvis with a number of concerning margins. Uh, the, this is a particularly ugly tumor here. You can see it's making very significant contact with lots of parts of the pelvis and a number of margins of concern. Uh, another one here that's pet avid again and again and again. So these are the types of tumors that I'm describing. And again, another particular one, we'll come back to this one at the end. Uh, going almost going through the sciatic notch in this situation. Um, this is a good example of, again, I think it highlights for me what this is all about. This is a 44-year-old lady who presented to us from a, she, she actually works in the healthcare industry. She had a locally recurrent rectal cancer um, and needed a total pelvic accentuation, distal sacrectomy, partial resection of a sciatic nerve. That's the sciatic nerve, which we partially resected here. That's the cut end of the sacrum. The internal iliacs have gone, there's the obturator nerve. And it was an Arnold resection, but with a margin of 1.3 millimeters. Um, do I believe the pathologist when they tell me it's a 1.3 millimeter margin? Absolutely not. We deliver them a specimen, you know, quite sizable. They're only gonna take a few five micron sections through that. There's huge um, liability for potential misreading and missampling of the specimen. So is there anything I could have done potentially to improve this lady's um, likelihood of local recurrence, IOT is one option in this situation. So our IOT journey started with experience and understanding built during fellowships uh, at a number of uh, ex uh, expert units like the MD Anderson, Mayo, Eindhoven, working with some remarkable teams. Um, we then evaluated the evidence base in 2011 and started a business case, and we obtained the Mobitron in 2016. The machine was tested. It was the first one in the UK and still is the only one in the UK at the moment at the National Physics Laboratory for a few months because it was the first one to arrive there. We then had a variety of staff training 
and uh, attending a number of, uh, again, international expert centers and did a number of dry runs and theater modica modifications. First case was in January 2017, and we now do one to two cases per week, but typically one a week. It's a whole team approach. You need oncologists, obviously, that are willing to come to theater. That's the oncologist and the physicist in theater. Another one of our oncologists looking down the barrel of the gun. They're usually smiling when they come to theater. They seem to like the experience, and that's, that's, that's great for us. Uh, anesthetists have helped in terms of modifying the theater for us. It's a whole team approach, uh, and we've done a number of dry runs. Um, this is an example of a case where it's worth discussing. She's, it's, it's a young man who's um, come into us with a locally advanced tumor making contact with the anterior table of the bone there and involving the bladder and into the pelvic sidewall on MRI scans of the pelvis. Uh, he's had a big resection. It's a pelvic accentuation. Um, we've removed everything in the pelvis, including the pelvic sidewall and the anterior table of the bone there. That's the catheter coming out. The bladder is obviously gone. And this is the margin I'm most worried about. I hope you can see my arrow there, that pelvic sidewall. And it was a very narrow margin. And that's the area looking now down the barrel of the applicator where I can deliver hopefully intraoperative radiotherapy at a reasonable dose. And if there are any residual cells left behind, mitigate for that potential R1. We've so far treated 202 cases. Uh, that's our total experience. The majority have been pelvic accentuation patients and they're listed here of the variety they are. It's actually much higher than that now. And most of them are now all in the trial. Um, but there's also some non exenterative patients which have been mostly pancreatic cancers, a gastric cancer and a head and neck tumor. The median age of these is 63, 54%. I'm just gonna talk about the results of the exenteration patients. All except three had had neoadjuvant treatment. Two patients in their late 70s declined neoadjuvant treatment because of the inconvenience of traveling for the multiple fractionations required for the radiotherapy. And one patient was unable to get uh, neoadjuvant chemo because of sepsis and a malignant fistula. The median of these are long operations. The median operative time was 12 and a half hours, but the range was six and a half to 28. The IOT dose delivered median was 10 gray, but it ranged from 10 to 15 gray. And the median applicator diameter was 6.5, but ranging from 5 to 10 centimeters. Um, 13 is much higher now. I have major vascular reconstructions of non expendable vessels within the IOT field. And the median length of stay of the whole group was 17 days. There was no 30 day and 90 day mortality. 65% of patients had a minor complication, and there were no clavian dindo 4 or 5 complications. One patient has had a ureteric stricture needing stenting. Um, and uh, there were no other IOT specific complications such as bony necrosis, neuropathy, and no vascular complications like false aneurysms, which were the main things I was particularly worried about. This is probably the most important bit. 15 patients had an R1 resection and 42 patients had R0, but close margins, less than three millimeters. That's a, an arbitrary definition, but it's used in the literature. And in these patients, there were uh, the IOT field recurrences were only one which I think is very significant. Uh, local regional non iot field recurrences took place, there were three, and there were of course systemic recurrences of 24%, but the lack of local iot field recurrences was particularly telling in my, field, in my view. Um, okay, so what's the evidence base for all of this in rectal cancer? So we conducted a collaborative study between Southampton Imperial College and the MD Anderson, this was back in 2011, uh, which was published in 2013. And the aim was really to review the data and summarize the field and meta-analyze if possible. I won't bore you with the full data, um, but essentially the quality of studies, as you might expect, were low. There was, however, improved a, a trend of an improved overall survival, disease-free survival, and local control favoring IOT, with the effect size potentially as much as four times reduction in local relapse in margin close or positive cases. So since then, there have been a further two systematic reviews and meta-analyses suggesting that IOT favors local control. There's no increase in complications. Overall survival, however, suggestion is seemingly is unaltered, but both recommend the need for higher levels of evidence with better trial design and patient selections, not surprisingly. Um, there's a number of international statements from the Beyond TME consensus and from a number of UK initiatives, all of whom again point to the fact that we need better quality data in this field. So with that in mind, we started designing a trial, which uh, we hope to apply to rectal cancer. 
Um, and we had a number of meetings and workshops with experts, methodologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, and statisticians. We used the European Society of Coloproctology and the uh, Association of Coloproctology of Britain and Ireland, as well as the ACRS meetings to set up sub-meetings. And we presented and discussed these at previous intra-op user group meetings and at preceding the ISI org meetings. Uh, with patient groups, referring hospitals and clinicians, and also with research funding bodies and charities. The results were that likely the best initial question to evaluate is the role of IOT as an additive to ex existing standard of care. Everyone generally felt that randomization was required for impact and practice change, particularly in the UK. It, felt, it was felt that we needed blinding for credibility and to avoid confounding, and that a phase two or a three after a feasibility could be practice changing. And the key challenges that people repeatedly highlighted to us were, are you gonna be able to recruit because you're looking at lateral and the posterior zones and a rare type of patients? And can you get standardization of radiology, surgery and pathology? And what are the key endpoints that you're gonna measure? Are you gonna measure the right things? So the feasibility stage in particular was felt to be uh, key as it would aim to determine acceptability to patients for recruitment and randomization to IOD containing and IOD emitting arms, particularly in the UK and Europe. Um, we wanted to obtain pilot oncological quality of life and health economic data, and to see if we could then develop support during that time to run an international multi-center phase two, three study. And so, the ELECTRA trial was born, which stands for Interoperative Electron Radiotherapy in Rectal Cancer, and it's a randomized, controlled, three-armed, double-blinded, feasibility-first trial, planned in a single center, but planned to then run into multi-center late phase study, hopefully. It's funded by charity support, Intraop and CRUK endorsed, Cancer Research UK endorsed, um, with access to um, trial teams. And it's run by our clinical trials unit. And that's the details there. And the QR code was at the beginning and I'll have it at the end as well. Um, essentially, patients with locally advanced or locally recurrent cancer who, with involvement of the pelvic side walls are receive their standard of care neoadjuvant treatment according to the center's choice. And then they become randomized. And the randomization is either extended margin surgery alone, extended margin surgery and intraoperative radiotherapy at a standard dose, at a, a conventional dose, or at a higher dose. Inclusion criteria is non-metastatic or oligometastatic locally advanced rectal cancer or locally recurrent rectal cancer involving the posterior or lateral compartments and a specialist MDT with experience in pelvic accentuation reviewing the patient and proposing IOT as a treatment modality. Exclusion criteria is unresectable disease or a likelihood of an R2 resection and an MDT determined uh, or MDT determined that the patient has had excessive radiotherapy within the IOT target zone. The primary outcome at feasibility is acceptability and feasibility of recruiting and randomizing and delivering this and acceptability of randomizing to non iot arm for patients. And the secondary outcomes are what you might expect, so efficacy, cost effectiveness and quality of life and health economics. But the primary outcome of the late phase stage is IOT field local control. And I think this is critical. That's the only thing we, that this, this, this treatment is designed to mitigate for. And that's what we should be measuring in this setting. We've developed a standardized approach to radiology, which is now um, UK wide. Um, we've also developed a standardized approach to pathology, which we're putting through the Royal College of Pathologists here, because it, it requires that. And a standardized approach to surgery and the descriptions and this is part of the UK pelvic accentuation network that we developed as a consequence of all of this. What about volume of cases? That was a key question that was asked. Well, actually, there's been a lot of centralization of complex cancer surgery units in Europe and in the UK, and there's been a formation of national and international organizations such as the Pelvex, UK Pelvic Accentuation Network, etc. cetera. There have been guidelines that have been developed. And so the landscape of this has changed and low volume, highly complex surgery is generally now centralized. And so far, we've actually found that we've over-recruited to this trial and it, it's, it's recruiting really well. So that, that concern was, has been blown out. I talked about the primary outcome and how are we gonna measure the IOT field local control? This is a patient who's had a pelvic accentuation. Uh, we're looking at the sciatic nerve exposed after removal of the sidewall as well. And we've applied these clips to mark the site of the IOT field. And that's the area that we're then gonna follow up in the post-op period. 
and another case here where you can see the clips of involving the pelvic sidewall where the patients have IORT. And these can be followed, obviously not radiologically, but on CT scans. This is an example of a patient with a locally recurrent tumor uh, coming up to the ischial spine on, this, on the left side. Uh, the patient's subsequently gone on to have an exenturation, small bowels dropped into the pelvis. We've put omentum over this area and we've taken that bit of the ischial spine as part of the on block resection. And you can see on the subsequent scans, there's a clip there, there's a clip there. And that's where we targeted the IOT. So that is the IOT field that we're then subsequently following up in surveillance to check for IOT field local failures. This patient I showed earlier, she's a very young lady. She's got a very advanced, ugly tumor going into the side wall and through the notch. Um, this is clearly the area that I'm worried about and that the area I'm most likely of getting an R1. She's gone on to have a total pelvic accentuation. Uh, we re reconstructed it with mesh, momentum, and flaps. But unfortunately, you can see while this area is clear of disease recurrence, she's sadly developed disease recurrence here. It's within the pelvis, it's regional failure, but it's not IOT field. And that this is an important distinction, obviously, for this sort of trial. So the study opened in May 2022. The first two months we couldn't recruit because the patients had previously been promised to have IOT and they wanted it. Subsequently, all patients told that they could only access this as part of the trial. And we've now had 23 patients recruited in 12 months. Uh, that's including the two months that we couldn't recruit and a further 12 eligible patients identified but not consented who are currently having their neoadjuvant treatment. These are comments from the recruited patients that they would have preferred not to be randomized to non iot arm, a lot of them. And in that, again, this is another telling comment from one of the patients in the setting of imperfect pre-op information, abnormal and hard to judge anatomical planes at surgery and a well-tolerated intervention that doesn't add hugely to an already long operation is there much to lose. And I, I would agree with that patient entirely. And this is where actually we, we may need your help. Um, we're seeking to involve international units interested in participating in the next phase of this trial. And we, can, we can't do this alone. We need other units involved in this process. And we want to involve them now so we can help evolve and process and optimize the design of the trial if required. And we want to discuss surgical, radiological and pathological quality control across units for the next phase of the trial and also to develop the process for funding it. Um, there, are, there may be some international units um, who don't have, have been doing IOT, for example, for a long time and may not have equipoise in terms of randomizing to a non-IOT arm. And that's why this trial has three arms in particular, a low dose and a high dose. So units that have equipoise in randomizing to a non-IOT arm can randomize to all three arms. Units that no, don't have equipoise and have been doing IOT for a long time may feel only able to randomize to these two arms, so a low dose and a high dose arm. And that's why we've particularly designed it that way. So in summary, IORT and rectal cancer is definitely not a panacea. And I really love that slide of uh, Christina's, which, which was a small piece of the puzzle. It has a poor evidence base, however. It is a complementary treatment to surgery and multimodality treatment in selected cases of locally advanced and locally recurrent rectal cancer. But it is one that needs some level one evidence, hopefully. It's the theory of marginal gains. And it, for me, opening up of the theater to oncology. And it's another frontier in the evolution of multimodality care like HIPEC, like IOT. And I think an international multi-center collaborative research effort in carefully designed study is probably the only way to influence this field going forward. Uh, there's a lot of people to thank, obviously, and I put the trial management group there and the various teams that are involved uh, and happy to take any questions. And that's the um, uh, QR code for the trial if anyone's interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marizami, that was excellent. It seems people are being a little shy. If anyone missed it, we're asking that you post your questions in the chat group at the bottom. I'm really happy for them to pose the tricky questions to Duke. <laughs> Saving it all. Yeah. And, I, and I'm really happy to phone a friend. <laughs> <laughs> are there any particular questions about, go ahead. There's one that popped up, Christy. Great, okay. Um, so. They're asking, what is the rationale to exclude cases with R2 resection? Does that imply IORT is not effective for cases with gross residual disease? Ah, so that, that's a really good question. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so no, there are units which use IORT in the setting of R2 resections, 
but we felt that in the setting of a trial, we wanted to keep it really focused on the R1s, which are the most important ones we felt in this particular group. I think if there were a lot of R2s, the statisticians felt that that might skew the, the results. Generally, most units, certainly in the UK, would also not want to do pelvic excentration surgery in the setting of an R2, because the data has shown that uh, an R2 resection in the pelvis is not a lot different to palliative treatment in, in terms of outcomes. And so generally people steer away from it. And so it would, we felt that it would probably limit the number of patients we might, we, might, we might get recruited to that group. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the question. I'll stop sharing now. All right. Next, we have Dr. Blocka. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one more question, if you don't mind. Let me see, my chat box popped one away. Um, what are the dose levels between the standard and high dose? So another good question, thank you uh, for that. So we, we've gone a little bit conservative in the feasibility stage and gone for 10 and 15 gray. Um, obviously higher doses can also be applied, but that was what we thought after discussing with a few other units was probably the most sensible starting positions, bearing in mind that a lot of these patients, if they've got locally advanced disease, have already had conventional 45 gray to 50 gray of chemo radiotherapy beforehand, of radiotherapy beforehand, or if they've had local recurrence, they may have had re-radiation on top of an extra 30 gray. So that, that was an initial starting dose for us, we felt. Thank you. Can we pause just a second longer if anyone's typing? I think we're good to move on, Dr. Blocka. Thank you. Um, you guys seeing the correct slide and everything's okay? Okay. So it's a privilege uh, to follow Christine and Alex, and I hope to do as good a job and make this talk as eloquent as they put it together. Um, I am, full disclosure, I am not a surgeon. I'm a radiation oncologist, <laughs> and, and, but I am good friends with my surgeons, and we were, really work as a team. And I think uh, our, both Christine and, and Alex made that point well, and, and I'm going to follow up on that as well. Uh, so so I, Duke, you're basically telling us you're the smartest speaker of the three. No, that's, right, that's not true. That's not true. <laughs> um, but uh, I appreciate the vote of confidence. But in any event, the, so the, the trial is called the HN Solve trial, and it, it's really wonderful because, the full disclosure, the intraop team is funding this feasibility trial, and I'll talk about sort of leading up to why uh, we chose to do this and how we chose to do it, and and uh, the concept of working as a team so that we can really improve upon all of the, the care. Um, so just as a background, um, the care for recurrent uh, or persistent head and neck cancer uh, is predominantly surgical and uh, radiation follows uh, and chemo radiation follows, uh, but it's, it's poor outcomes. And the phase three trial that we do have uh, was done by our colleagues of France where they looked at 130 patients and randomized them to surgery followed by observation versus surgery followed by 60 gray of external beam radiation with concurrent 5-FU and hydroxyurea. Uh, what's important to note about this trial is that the randomization uh, to which arm you were going to be occurred before we knew any kind of pathologic findings. So things like PNI, close margins, positive margins, uh, LVI, and so forth, uh, were not known until much, much uh, later. And people argue that one of the reasons why we didn't see an overall survival benefit here is, is exactly that. However, we did see a significant local control benefit, uh, which is why the standard of care, if possible, is surgical resection followed by concurrent chemo RT. But as you can imagine, the grade three toxicities can go up as high as 40%, and it's not, uh, um, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, so what well, at Ohio State, we've been doing um, IORT for three decades now, and we looked at our cases within a 10-year span, 
and we found 61 cases where we did uh, um, salvage uh, RT, uh, 55 had recurrence, six had persistent disease, and our dose ranges, as you can see, are pretty standard to the previous speakers as well. They range between 10 to 17 and a half, with 20, 12 and a half being um, the, the median dose. Um, most people, what's really interesting here is at Ohio State, we're in central Ohio, and we have a catchment of patients uh, with a radius of about three hours. And because of this, a lot of our patients actually can't come back uh, for any further treatment. And so what ended up happening in our cohort is about two thirds of the patients only had surgery and only had IORT. So despite this being uh, retrospective, the data, was, the outcomes were really interesting in the sense that um, we still got local control in the 60% range, which was uh, indicative of our uh, phase three trial uh, that I just showed earlier. So we had one year local control at 60%, one year overall survival at around 60% as well. Uh, this is just a pictorial view. And the toxic toxicities were also within about a 10% range. We did have one grade five toxicity, and we think this was because we had a um, split thickness skin graft placed over the carotid at the time of surgery. So we did have a carotid blowout there. But the other significant toxicities that we had were ORN, wound dehiscence, PC, uh, percutaneous fistulas, and tracheoesophageal fistulas. And so when we published this paper, we were very excited in the sense that, you know, we're starting to see in this really difficult uh, population that despite only about 60% of the patients receiving, um, are not receiving anything else, and only 40% receiving post-operative RT to a dose of 40 to 50 gray, as well as only about 15% receiving post-operative chemo RT, we were getting pretty good data. And so this was published in Head and Neck. Um, and right around this time, around 2016, we started to see immunotherapy come into play for head and neck and, and the concept of can we somehow jumpstart the immune system to really benefit um, our patients. And in, in full disclosure, um, I'm going to use sort of an American uh, analogy here in the sense that saying that immunotherapy in the head and neck is like a single in, in baseball. It's not a double, it's not a triple, it's far from a home run. Uh, we only have about 13 to 18% response rates. And it becomes really difficult to understand who's that person that's going to respond. And yet the cost of this, of this immunotherapy treatments is actually pretty high. And so we embarked at our institution. We embarked at this institution. Oops, I think I have a, excuse me. Oh boy, I don't know how to turn that off. There we go. And so what, what we did was we combined, uh, we looked at our, our caseload from 2016 to uh, 2020, and we looked at all of our patients uh, that, that had immunotherapy in the recurrence slash metastatic ray. And we found uh, an interesting nomogram that helped us uh, really see who are the patients that that are benefiting from from immunotherapy, and we were able to divide these folks into groups where we had about a 24 month uh, median survival versus an 18 month versus um, a three month overall survival. And right around this time as well, there's some incredible work being done in looking at the immune effect. And starting to look, and this is the work by uh, Dr. De, uh, Fermenti and Dr. Di Maria where they started to show that different doses of radiation seem to have a different effect from a molecular standpoint. Um, and so doses of A-gray uh, times three and actually induced uh, the immune system, whereas doses of 20 gray and more actually um, suppress the immune system through the T-Rex promoter region. And so when we look at all of this and we said, well, we have immunotherapy working, we have uh, surgery helping us, we have IORT specifically as well. Um, what can we do to sort of combine these treatment modalities? And as Alex really nicely said, it's not, it's not one modality, it's this combination of modalities that hopefully will work synergistically. And so we started the HN cell trial about uh, COVID was really um uh, sort of a rate limiting step if you will for us and for many centers across the the, the globe uh, but what we did was we decided to look at these patients and we randomized them to 
uh, these three arms where we're giving pre-op radiation therapy, either zero gray or two gray times two or a gray times two. Then the patients get surgery at intraoperative radiation, uh, 10 to 15 gray, and they get immunotherapy one to two doses prior and then up to one year after. Uh, so currently we're on our sixth patient. Uh, we're sort of chugging along um, some logistical issues in terms of uh, approval for immunotherapy and so forth, but uh, the team is getting better and better with each recruitment and more and more efficient. Uh, and so we're quite excited because we're looking at clinical outcomes here potentially. Obviously, toxicity is our primary endpoint here. But what's really exciting to me from a translational standpoint is that we're going to have now tissue uh, where we're going to have tissue before and after immunotherapy, before and after two gray times two in immunotherapy, and before and after a gray times two in immunotherapy. And so we're going to be able to do some of these comparisons. We have fresh tissue for these patients as well. Uh, there's some eloquent work from Barcelona that was just uh, uh, published a, a little while ago where in breast cancer, they're showing that IORT actually itself seems to induce the immune system, at least in that disease side. And that's something we want to look for as well in our blood samples for our patients. Um, the other thing that we're very fortunate at Ohio State having is, is the intraop flash uh, uh, component and flash RT is, is an exciting um, area of research. Uh, I don't think it's going to pan out to be as, as incredible, but I, we're seeing definitely flash effects and uh, we're seeing, you know, the folks in uh, Chauvin have done a lot of great work to look at this and and the idea of uh, you know providing these treatments in microseconds seems to have different mechanisms of uh, of response and folks have seen these pictures so I just want to go through them quickly but the idea of these high doses and having skin sparing effects uh, both from you know gross view but also from H and E stains um, you know cats with uh, uh, cancers in, in, on their nose and treatment after, uh, in-kind treatment for uh, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma patients uh, with good response. Um, and our team here at OSU is really sort of working together under Dr. Chakravarty's leadership, but also with the College of Veterinary Medicine here at OSU uh, to not only work with mice, but also higher uh, animals, the canine and feline and potentially equine animals as well. And then also uh, uh, skin treatments for um, human patients initially. So in, in our, at OSU, we've had the Intrap uh, flash machine since 2020. Um, we also have a variant clinic that was installed in 2022. So another modality for, for um flash generation. And, and in 2023, we hope to have proton flash as well. And so the idea is to start to look at these uh, in, in different modalities and make sure. Um, but from a head and neck standpoint, the, the opportunity to potentially use flash radiotherapy in the future um, for recurrent or persistent disease within the, the operating room, I think is really interesting. This is just a a little bit of data from our institution showing that uh, we are seeing the flash effect. Um, and uh, um, we're in process now, we're close to starting our canine trial for this. And uh, we are working with the FDA for ID approval currently for the human skin trial. Um, and we can see the flash effect at 36 gray, uh, but it seems to be a very complicated concept and, and may have a specific inflection point and there's quite a few uh, variables that we're still working out. We're excited uh, sometime this winter to have our uh, multi-room uh, probeam uh, so that one of, in the fixed beam areas where a lot of our uh, experiments are gonna be done, uh, which we're quite excited about and hope to, to add to the literature in a significant way. Um, I'm gonna finish by saying that this is always a team, um, the ISIORT team in general, the team here at OSU, uh, and we're all being patient-centric and we need to work as a team together towards um, moving all of our clinical trials forward in a meaningful way. And uh, the last slide is just acknowledgements. This is you know, just a small group of folks, uh, Arnav and John. John's been doing IORT for, for three decades and it's a privilege to have him as a as a uh, mentor and as a colleague and uh, the entire team together. And of course, I want to thank everyone here uh, for listening. And uh, if there's any hard questions, please make sure you give them to Alex.
uh, he's really good at answering those questions. And Christina's pretty good too. So wait, no, don't give me any of the hard ones, please. <laughs> Thanks for everyone's attention. Thank you so much. All right, we, wait, nope, that was no question, sorry. Okay, we have a question for you, great talk. What disease sites do you use IORT the most at OSU? So we had a great question. We had a, we use it for breast, head and neck, uh, GI, so pancreas and, and rectal cancer. Um, GU uh, recurrences. Uh, so breast was uh, the highest used until the trial just finished recently. So we're reporting some outcomes on that under Dr. Bazan's leadership and uh, Dr. Jawar's leadership. So, uh, but I think it's a, a pretty good mix of all of those together. Head and neck is about, let's say a couple of month on average. Thank you. Okay, we have another one. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, when you give IO first prior to salvage surgery, how many patients progress leading up to operation? Uh, great question. It's pretty quick. Uh, if we're worried about progression in any way, we, um, out of the six patients that we've had, we had one that we were actually worried about progression. Uh, and the surgery went from being, you know, within two weeks of the uh, immunotherapy and external beam, and we moved it up to within three days. Uh, interestingly, pathologically, we found that actually uh, there was no tumor there, and that was a sort of a pseudo progression and an immune effect. Uh, so we're actually happy, uh, you know, surprised and and excited about it. But if we see any increase, we uh, we really work as a team to move things up and and be very diligent about that. Thank you. Since you are treating all disease sites, do you have a specific radiation oncology team in charge of IORT, or everyone is involved? So each disease site has about two to three main docs uh, involved. Uh, Head and neck has uh, three people that do this, uh, and uh, GI has a couple, uh, breast has a couple, and then uh, we have a few folks that have been doing this for decades that can do all of it. And so the idea is to provide this modality to any patient that may need it. Uh, so not everyone does it. it it's it's focused in and uh, folks that are wanting to get trained, they usually would do about five to 10 assisted uh, with someone senior. And then uh, even when they're on their own, they'll have someone like myself or John or Doug or someone that's helping uh, Doug Martin, who's going to sort of just be there to, to support, I guess. Uh, I remember when I was first doing it on my own, uh, I was very thankful I had one of those old school basketball sort of bandanas because man was I sweating bullets. <laughs> and one of the things that I really appreciate our surgeons and how hard they work is, you know, often they're trying to make decisions uh, right in that moment. There's no choices of trying to get out or walk away or uh, you have to make a decision right then and there and do the best you can for that patient. And and although I do this very, you know, a small portion of the total operation, I have a huge appreciation for for their uh, intense work and, and, and the situations that are put in often in the operating room. It's very impressive. Thank you. I also got uh, some uh, questions I don't want to type in the chat, but <laughs> so uh, particularly on the flash, um, set aside the logistic issues, uh, you know, such as IDE meetings, you know, approval. Let's say the machine is approved for flash IORT. Um, what are the barriers to transfer a flash and uh, to be in combine to be combined with IORT to treat patients? So we're initially, I mean, we're talking about IORT. We we need to have the opportunity to have a theater and a and a team that allows for IORT development, either in conventional or flash uh, uh, components, but. 
the barriers are really exposure. And that's why we need different modalities. The protons is going to be very important because we can think about depth uh, from an IORT standpoint for flash. You know, it, it, electrons can only go so deep. Uh, and so you need that exposure in order to, pro to provide it. And so in the operating room, I think, uh, you know, this is something that I think can be done. Uh, I think it's going to have to be very careful as to how we, I like, uh, I liked Alex's few slides about how he went through and had multiple discussions and meetings and subgroups and, and really got a lot of people involved to come up with the best way forward. For our canine uh, treatments, we, we've made some specific, um, and also for the flash IDE, um, for humans, we've, you know, we've kept it to smaller tumors on the skin, uh, not too deep, uh, because the first concept is feasibility and, and sort of moving forward. But your point is well taken. I think there's a lot of work to be done in order to get this right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I uh, uh, don't mind, uh, you know, uh, diving a little bit more details. I'm trying to think about take a pancreatic case as a you know IRT flash as an example. Does uh, does flash potentially make medical sense? Uh, which means that you can potentially increase the dose. But the question is, uh, if we can rely on the flash effect, and then allow us to do dose escalation, does that benefit the patient or not? Or we don't know. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Christina to chime in as well, but at my end, um, I don't know that we know those answers just yet. So you know, still... if the radiation oncologist says that, then the surgeon definitely doesn't know the answer. <laughs> I mean, look, right now we're seeing variable responses to the flash effect. Mm -hmm. Right. And so even in our hands, we've seen it in skin. We haven't uh, completely seen it in GI specifically. Uh, so I think there's just so many variables in terms of pulse, pulse, uh, uh, dose rate, um, and all these variables seem to be like one of these gears where if you change one, two other things may change simultaneously. So that flash window seems to be a narrow sort of window that I think we still need to define. And more importantly, you know, hard to say that we're going to do something without really knowing the true mechanism of how this is working. And people talk about oxygen depletion and so forth, but these again are postulations and, and hypotheses. And I think the flash effect and the mechanisms and, and where that flash effect is occurring is still a research question. Yeah, thank you very much. Great question. Sorry, I don't have better answers. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> right. We do have another question. Um, would you treat all cases by flash when it is available? If not, what is the disease site that will benefit the most from flash? So great question. And I think it goes back to the previous uh, you know, question that was there. We don't know the answer to this. We're seeing it in skin. We, we have some uh, implications in CNS. Uh, we have some uh, mixed data in GI. Um, but it's something that needs to be considered. What I love about our trial is often we're looking at, you know, mouse work or tissue samples, uh, the opportunity to actually have tissue samples before and after, or potentially doing work where we're looking at mouse and canine uh, patients where we have before and after flash to look at those molecular changes. I mean, Christina showed this beautiful uh, molecular information and showing how treatment causes migration and, and changes the heterogeneity of the tumor and changes how the tumor is actually acting. You know, what does flash do to that? What is flash with multiple uh, doses or uh, multiple fractions? We don't know the answer to that. What about flash with different pulse uh, uh, with and, and different doses based on those pulses and and uh, about dose rate. And so these are all sort of TBD. Um, but I don't, I mean, just from preliminarily, it seems like there's different effects. But if we can start to get into the mechanism, I think we can start to have a much better handle of where we are. But I think this is, uh, you know, not even first mile of the marathon. And so I think uh, a lot to be done. But exciting. 
definitely an exciting field. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, or the previous speakers, anything? Okay, I'm not seeing anything coming up in our chat. So I think we can start to wrap this up. Um, again, I just wanna thank everyone for taking the time to be here today. A special thank you to our speakers. We really appreciate you all taking the time to learn a little bit more about uh, Mobitron, IRT programs, the interesting trials that are going on. Um, the, we, this is recorded and uh, Sarka, do you have any information on that? Yeah, thank you, Christy. And thank you so much for all the speakers. I really appreciate your time that you've given us. Um, and thank you so much for uh, lovely attendees and the engaging questions that we got today. Um, this session is recorded and I will be I will have a link that I will send to Richard and Christy. So if you reach out to us, we can send you the link to the folks who could not make it and would like to hear some of these sessions. So I'll have that link ready right after this call. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Great to oh, see you, bye. Alex and Christina. Thank Cheers. you. Bye, everyone.